My name is Kirk Dunn, and this is the Knitting Pilgrim Talks. I'm an actor, writer, and knitter, and I'm also known as the Knitting Pilgrim. I earned that title because in 2003, I was awarded an Ontario Arts Council Chalmers Grant to knit stitched glass, an installation of three large panels designed in the style of stained glass windows, which look at the commonalities and the conflicts between the three Abrahamic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They took me 15 years to knit. And when the project was complete, my wife Claire and I wrote a play called The Knitting Pilgrim about my experience knitting stitch glass and my research into interfaith relations. One thing that wasn't covered in the play was the meaning behind the imagery in the knitted panels. So, this series explores each section in conversation because, ultimately, the project is about having conversations with empathy and curiosity about how we understand and sometimes misunderstand each other. Welcome to the Knitting Pilgrim Talks. The section we're exploring today in the Knitting Pilgrim Talks is uh, part of the Christian tapestry or, or panel. It uh, deals with uh, patriarchy or exclusion um, in the Christian church. And in this section, we can see a, a female form who's reaching up to the figure on the cross and she's being um, marginalized or, or pushed aside. And then in, in the background, we can see some triangles and uh, the brown triangles um, uh, evoke the vulva, and the pink triangles represent the LGBTQ community, which has been persecuted and ostracized by the Christian church. And to discuss this section with uh, me today, I am happy to welcome the Reverend Janet Ruchan. Uh, Janet is uniquely qualified to talk about today's section in the Christian window. Um, and having grown up and negotiating in being a Korean in a very white Anglo-Saxon neighborhood of Toronto. And then um, she also worked her way through some very patriarchal notions of her church to pursue a calling to become a member of the clergy. And uh, uh, right now she is occupying the pulpit of Morningside Hyde Park Presbyterian Church, where I am happy to attend and very happy to call her my friend. Welcome, Reverend Janet. Uh, thank you, Kirk. Just call me Janet. <laughs> okay, Janet. So, patriarchy in the Christian church. Now, I alluded to some things there in introducing you about your, your personal history. And, and certainly there's a lot we can talk about with regard to uh, the theology and the infrastructure of the church through history and even today. But I'm wondering if you can share with us a little bit of what it was like for you to grow up in the church and and then pursue uh, a calling to the ministry as a woman. So I grew up in the Presbyterian Church in Canada, but within the Korean cultural context. So um, I was baptized at a Korean church, and it's interesting because I don't, we, we didn't have confirmation, or I don't recall confirmation in the Korean context. So there are many new things that I discovered uh, coming into, uh, I guess, the Caucasian uh, church within the PCC. And that's where I would eventually discover a calling. But, but as a little girl growing up, um, and you might have experienced this, no female elders. Uh, but we did have, interestingly, female deaconesses. So Koreans are obsessed, or at least in my experience, with titles. Um, sometimes I wonder if that's a power dynamic and a sense of honor, because of course, um, well, not of course, but Koreans come from an honor shame cultural background, which is very similar to what Jesus would have grown up in. Um, and so having a title, I guess, makes one feel good to hear it. it ironically, makes me very uncomfortable. So um, we had many female deaconesses and they did 
they would cook meals in the church and uh, their role was certainly not of elder they they didn't have any kind of governance power as far as i could tell but mind you i was a child uh, but th that was interesting so for me, I could see the women serving and some of them have titles. And of course, the older women like my grandmother had another title. And um, but I never saw myself as a minister because I guess I just never saw any female ministers, mm -hmm. um, no female elders. So this was also compounded by growing up in a very patriarchal culture. So. Right very not only top-down model because of um, age uh, mm -hmm. there was also the women always served the men uh, the son rose and set with my father who carried on the family name right so it was not until uh, I started attending a youth group at a Presbyterian church um, where I guess I saw um, there were female elders and then when I went to St. Giles Kingsway uh, as a woman in my 20s, that's when there were people there who thought I had gifts for ministry and then invited me into the discernment process. That to me was really quite surprising because, first of all, I didn't even, even know such a thing existed, mm -hmm. uh, a discernment process, and that uh, a church would walk one through that. And so that was quite lovely, that community right. process and, of discernment. And so uh, what, what is a discernment process then for those of us who, who, who are surprised by it as well? Uh, so as well, what I experienced was there were um, elders on that committee. And I remember there were questions that were asked of me and I can't even remember how long it took. I mean, it wasn't like a week long process. It was more than that. And it was to discern with me, to talk with me, to walk with me as I guess I explore, do I have gifts for ministry? Um, and it was really neat because there were a number of women elders on that. And actually one of the women, um, who walked with me through that discernment process is an elder at Morningside High Park. So God works in very mysterious and wondrous ways. And what a small world it is as a Presbyterian. Uh, that's great. That is great. And how did it feel? Uh, how did your personality fit in with this, the expectations of, you know, where a woman's place was in your, in that church uh, you attended growing up? Like how did, I mean, yeah. How did that work for you personally? Yes. Uh, I remember comments like I was wild and um, couldn't I be quiet and why did I have so many questions and oh when I look back in some ways I, I'm a little bit embarrassed because <laughs> I did give some of my Sunday school teachers a really really hard time uh, if you looked up the word arrogant you would have seen my picture <laughs> but I think that was partly because um, I felt I wasn't heard otherwise mm -hmm that I had to be loud. Um, otherwise, I would, you know, the women that were admired were those who were graceful and uh, very feminine, like, I guess, how they dressed and, right. you know, their, their body type. And while I was short and stocky and I liked sports, I was a tomboy. I'd rather wear shorts and pants than a skirt, you know, and my mother would make me wear a skirt to church. Right. So I loved going to St. Andrews Islington as a youth because I'd wear my jeans to church. <laughs> That's great. And you mentioned earlier that uh, you know, there are some parts of the um, of a Korean society, which is uh, honor and shame um, sort of a dynamic. And you equated that to what would have been uh, the experience of someone like Jesus in Palestine. So <clears throat> I'm wondering, um, from... The New Testament's point of view, so from the Gospels, what we can see about the stories we have about Jesus, how was his treatment of women at that time? How did that differ than what other people were doing or what how society was treating women? So um, there's one story that I've particularly been drawn to, and it's the story of the bleeding woman, and she bled for 12 years. Um and because she w was bleeding, she would have been considered unclean. 
and would have brought shame to her family. So um, I can't imagine not just her physical discomfort and suffering, but also the the emotional and spiritual and mental impact that would have had on her because she would have been isolated, um, I imagine, right? Because she was considered unclean. So I, I, I imagine there's this crowd because people have heard that this healer, this teacher has come. Um, there's this musical musical called Jesus Christ Superstar, right? And literally, superstar. You think of Beyonce and how crazy people go or, or you know, um, these famous athletes. And, and there was a reason why Jesus was so popular. He could do things that no one else could do. So I just imagine, you know, the, the smell of body sweat and the dust and the crowds, all those people. And she you know, somehow desperately weaves through, you know, I don't know, was she bent down low through all the feet and the smell and the dust? Because all she wanted to do, because she believed that if she could just touch the fringe of his hem, she would be healed. And to be touched by someone un unclean, you would have shame, right? Like you don't want to be touched by anyone unclean. And in this beautiful story, Jesus feels the power leaving him. Now, I can't remember which gospel story that is from because there are three versions of this story. But I imagine Jesus turning around saying, you know, who touched me? Um, not in an accusatory sort of, I'm going to get you tone, but, you know, a sacred moment in which you know you've been touched because someone is longing for healing and that you can gift that to them. So that story for me is not just of healing, but it is of justice because she would be restored to her community because she was finally clean. Right? She was no longer the outsider, uh, someone to be isolated and ashamed of, embarrassed by. So here for me is a wonderful example of Jesus um, enveloping her because uh, where is it here in Luke? So Jesus said, someone touched me for I noticed that power had gone for me. When the woman saw that she could not remain hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Right? And then I think that's just such a loving image of being of, of who Jesus is, who gathers all towards, uh, to him, um, those who, who want to reach out and touch. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, it very much lines up with so many other stories of uh, Jesus relating to women uh, throughout the gospel. Um, and there's a, there's a theology that is, you know, if not explicit, then certainly implicit or implied that, that um, there's an equivalence between men and women. Like they, they are equal. He doesn't seem to treat them differently um, at all. And yet, um, then, and then also, I mean, there's also <laughs> this, uh, the fact that it's the men who, who betray Jesus, right? The, uh, the apostles leave him alone. Peter denies him. He's, you know, the apostles don't um, show up to the crucifixion. And then um, the, uh, the resurrection is witnessed by uh, the first person is, is a woman is uh, Mary. So, I mean, how, it, it, what I find ironic sometimes is how we came, went from that theology of equivalence and, in fact, the uh, theology of uh, um, appearing to the women first. And I've also heard it said that quite possibly um, most, the, the majority of the early church were, it may have been women. Um, how we went from there to this very patriarchal, um, male-centered uh, institution. Like how how did all that happen? That's a that's a really good question, and um, I just wonder if here's an example, and I wonder if it's witnessed also within the Jewish faith, where how at the beginning 
there seems to be more power that women have. And then as the centuries go by, that changes, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. in the Christian church, how that changes. And that's, uh, there are cultural influences. Um, now, I can't speak for our Jewish brothers and sisters, but but in the Christian context, uh, you just wonder with that, um, being in that Roman culture, uh, what were the place of women? And I don't think that they were, completely without power and yet um yeah that's a really good question Kirk. i i don't know quite how to answer that because i don't know enough of the history of mm-hmm. of that um what? certainly i i can speak only to the effects that we experience today yeah yeah and i i think the uh um the thing that we that we know about the church is that it's it, it doesn't exist in solitude. It exists within a society, and it's affected by that society. And so, the patriarchy of society you know, definitely has um, an impact on the church. And I think, in so many ways, the whole point of the church is to try to change society for the better, as opposed to be changed by society. You know, to bring it into line with society. I think that. The battle in all faiths it is, you know, to take that initial idea of, hey, we should be doing this differently and protect that and keep that and, and keep it fresh. And I think one of the things that um, the early church was doing or that, that Jesus himself was doing was saying you know, women and men are equal. And in fact, you mentioned the, the idea of, um, of the what was happening in the in the Jewish faith. I, I spoke with uh, Rabbi Jennifer Gorman, who who looked at the the actual um, sentence structure of the creation of Adam and Eve, and um, that sentence structure is that they were they were without gender to begin with. It um, he created them male and female, but with the the initial words were not gender specific, so that there was no they were the same. That that whole idea of they start from the same place, so they are equal, and um, that's something I think that uh, the church needs to keep fighting for. That was the original idea. That's how Jesus um, treated women, and that's how we should be treating women. And of course, uh, the patriarchy of uh, society is pushing back against that. But that's the challenge. I mean, that's that's one of the reasons you're you're at church is you got to fight some fights. And this is uh, this is well, one of them. Yeah. So speaking of fighting some fights, um, you know, one of the things that uh, so Caroline Lewis, uh, she's written this book called She, um, and I wanted to share with you what I found so fascinating about uh, her understanding of John chapter one, and so you know, it's it's so fascinating to hear about the creation story and the non-gender aspect of, of, um, of that. In the Gospel of John, we have to reclaim some of that language, uh, so fighting for that, because what happens is the churches come in and how they've interpreted some of the language has made it more patriarchal. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, in the translation for John chapter 1, verse 18, it reads, no one has ever seen God. It is God, the only son who is close to the father's heart, heart, who has made him known. That's not actually the best translation of the Greek word. The best translation for that is not heart, but it's bosom. Bosom. Right, oh, which, really? Which is pretty feminine. And, you know, also when you talk about the... Uh, the the language and the translations um the the hebrew word for god is uh, without gender and they don't speak of god as a a he that's it's it is a god is a genderless idea and in the christian church we have um we have held on to this idea of god the father and so that uh, that pronoun, the, the he pronoun, has made it into our uh, our lexicon, and uh, and it's very hard to change that. Uh, I think it's that, that kind of stuff is, is happening now. People are working against that, and uh, but it's still it's interesting <laughs> to to hear people um, refer to God as she. 
because we're, we're stuck with English and we haven't he or she. We're starting to use they a little more, which in many ways would be very applicable for God, especially if you're talking about God in terms of Trinity. There's a good use for they. Uh, but it's interesting that um, people have a real, uh, they still to this day have a real, um, uh, I guess, emotional reaction to hearing that God is she that really tweaks uh, some people because God is supposed to be the white, the guy with the white long beard on a throne. That's who God is in their, in their image. Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember listening to uh, Paulette Brown. She's a minister in our presbytery, and she was speaking, um, oh, I think it was shortly after when George Floyd had been murdered. And I remember her calling God Mama God. And uh, Paulette Brown is, I think, um, from Jamaica originally, and certainly um, has experienced the collective trauma and her own, I'm sure, personal um, suffering with oppression and exclusion and all because of color. So when she when she calls God Mama God, for me it's so layered because of her life experience, um, of which I only know a wee bit. And I have to confess, Mama God. I was uncomfortable hearing that, Kirk. And the irony is I long for more feminine imagery for God. Not saying that I want God not to be he. That's not it. It's just that male and female, we were created in God's image. Um, now, I don't know what that happens, though, for those um, who don't relate to a gender. That, for me, is another quandary and something I, I have to wrestle with. But... But that God is more than just one gender, right? Uh, that's why I love in the, I can't remember which epistle it is, but you know how that, that say, I mean, that verse goes, you know, there's no slave, no free, no Greek, no Jew, no male, no female. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. And there's that, that uh, uh, theology of equivalence, right? We're all, we're all equal. And that idea that, you know, uh, God created us um, in, in his image or in God's image, male and female. Um you know, for me, the the important part of that is uh, God created us uh, in God's image. Like that's the thing. And once we once we start to just once we start to define things further, I mean that the, the um, and this I think is what happens with uh, with many of our creeds as well. Once we try to narrow in on exactly what we believe and get really get down to the, uh, the details, we start to leave things out. We start to um, leave uh, people out and ideas out, and I think we start to leave God out. I think the idea is, you know, for me, the thing that speaks to me in that verse is God created us in God's image. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there you go. That's how it happened. Yeah. And, you know, it makes me think of the Enlightenment and the Age of Reason uh, and then the, the separation of science and faith. They, they were intertwined for yeah. centuries, right? Mm -hmm. And people, well, people in the 19th, 20th century, for sure, have forgotten how intimately they were intertwined. Uh, people of faith were scientists. Yes. And for me, I think we're just coming to more of an awareness in the 21st century, the impact that the Enlightenment and the Age of Reason has had on faith yeah. and this dichotomy. And I and I think, too, I was listening to um, a university, I think she's from Princeton, uh, but she's a, a professor of the Old Testament and she's a, a woman who is Jewish. And her talk about how Plato influenced um, how Christians understand God and how that's very different from the Jewish understanding of God. Right. And I was like, whoa, and this is why I'm talking about the cultural impact. I mean, I wish I, I knew more about history and why there's such a patriarchy uh, that happens. Um, I don't know. Does it have to do with the fact that men are generally speaking, physically stronger? Eh? I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but what has happened is... Um, you know, in other religions, there's more talk about female goddesses, right? And yep. uh, you have priestesses, and and somehow in Christianity, uh, that role of priesthood was yeah became more men only. 
So how, how do you think we're doing as far as equality uh, between men and women in the church? Um, you know, we, we've come some distance, uh, um, but uh, how much further do you think we have to go? Wow. So I can only speak to my own experience, and mm-hmm. I think it really depends on on the church and where you go. Some churches are far more open and inclusive and understanding and willing to wrestle with difficult questions uh, and walk in uncertainty, right? Uh, that right. you don't have to limit God to the Nicene Creed or the right. Westminster Confession. Uh, and then there are other churches who, and maybe it has to do with personalities, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the Meyer Briggs, right? Yep. It can be one who's um, more intuitive or or one who's more, oh, I can't remember what they all are. But but <laughs> depending on how you learn, right? Yep. There, some people per, are more comfortable with uncertainty and other people are not. Um, you have feelers and you have thinkers. It doesn't mean that thinkers don't feel and feelers don't think. It's just that it's a different way of accessing the numinous, the sacred, the holy, the, you know. Um, so do we have a long way to go? Yes, for sure, I think, um, even in the more inclusive churches, because we're part of a larger whole, at least within the Presbyterian Church in Canada, right? We're not all on the same page. Uh, I remember at Knox, uh, so I started in 98, and even then I remember hearing, oh, yes, they will put profiles, so like resumes for female ministers, they would put it at the bottom of, let's say, a uh, um, group of profiles they would receive uh, and yes they will receive it but then they won't read it right so there were still ways of excluding women in the late 90s uh, from positions of ministry even though God may have been calling them if the congregation's leadership didn't want them there then they could make that happen um, so even uh, in terms of of today and and who's in positions of influence and leadership, uh, we we look at our, our secular society and and with the pandemic it's been crazy, right? Like how many women have stepped out of the workforce because of children, um, and how there have not been allowances even before the pandemic. Not many allowances have been made. So for example, when my mother had me, I think she took a month off compared to. 30 years, 40 years later, where now even men can get paternity leave. Yeah. But that's not across the board. That's not yeah. everywhere. Yeah. So within the church and its structure, who I look at um, the Anglican church, and I know that they have bishops, but I'd be, I'd be curious to know how many of those bishops are women. Um, in the Catholic church, the Pope has always been a man. Yes. Uh, mind you, the Catholics have Mary. Right. Like, so they do have feminine imagery, the mother of God. But for us as Presbyterians, um, I mean, I'd like to think that there is more equality among men and women. But. uh, Yeah, I don't know. Well, you I I like what you said there earlier about this idea of um, walking in, in uncertainty and being able to exist in, the, in that place. And uh, and you're right, there are some people who want things cut and dried, they want to know black and white. And um, they're not so interested in, in the mystery of God, they're interested in, in being sure, in that comfort of knowing, of having made a decision, and now, you know, things start to make sense. Um, and, you know, for me, uh, I think, that reclamation of of the mystery of God is is coming back a bit. I mean, that's I'm um, uh, certainly certainly the the deeper um, or, hmm, the more people I talk to who are um, who have studied theology and who are uh, integrally involved in the in the church and clergy and scholars, they are very interested in that mystery of God. That's fascinating, and they are pursuing that. And then you come down to the to the lay people, you know, like like the rank and file. A lot of them are not so interested in that, and they have 
they don't really question um, the rituals or the the habits or the ideas that they have formed. They think that this um, the the church is like a monolith. It's always been this way. What I understand the church to be is what the church is and always has been, and that's that. So, you know, opening up to that that mystery, I think, is the is a real um, opportunity to change for the better. But I wonder if sometimes clergy have to take responsibility for this too, right? So um, when we go to Knox, at least for me, we recognize that, oh, that word is not what I actually thought it was. So heart is actually better translated as bosom. Um, and we don't always share some of those things with our congregations. And then they think that, like I did when I was growing up at the Korean church, like the Bible somehow just floated down as is. Who knew that there were, what do you mean there were different scripts? What are you, oh, hello. What do you mean this is a story of the flood? There are actually other stories of the flood in the ancient Middle East. It's not unique to Christianity. Are you kidding me? Like, hello, really? So I don't know if you talked about this with the rabbi, but um, there are actually two creation stories. Oh, yes. But I grew up. Mm -hmm. As hearing it as only one Christian story. And I remember going to Knox and, and learning about it and being so surprised and then sharing it with a, a woman who went to a Chinese church. And she's like, these liberal seminaries, this is why, you know, basically the church is going to the crapper, right? Like, and there is, I think, for many, many of us, including myself, there is comfort and certainty. There is comfort. But there's also this fallacy that we all believe that there's such thing as control. There is no such thing as control. And yet many of us long for it. And I think when we feel certain about a faith, then we feel like we have more control. But then there's no need for God. Like if we could control everything, why would we need God? And that that whole thing of, the, of, of mystery, I think what the age of reason try to do is you know, they took an orange because I just had one for breakfast this morning. But, you know, if you if you peel it and you see the spray of the juices and then you smell it, right? Like if you think about that whole experience, it's like what the Age of Reason did was they just they just peeled it and they opened the fridge and they put it on. I mean, the orange and they put it under a microscope and they dissected everything and they lost the wonder of just peeling it, smelling it and tasting it, how the juice just spill over their taste buds. And, you know, we've, we've lost that sensual, at least within the Presbyterian, the Reformed context. I can't speak to our Catholic brothers and sisters who many of them still have all the bells and whistles. But I think it, we, we, in some ways, threw the baby out with the bathwater when the Reformers slipped from the Catholics because they do, I think, have a better sense of God create, created us to love the Lord with not only just our mind, which is a New Testament edition, but our soul, our strength, and our uh, heart. Well, what you're talking about with the that search for control and that use of the, the mind in many ways, in many ways, um, patriarchy uh, fits into that because it's a it's a system of control. It's a system of here's you do this, I do this. Women do this and not that, and these are our roles and you know the. The more we fit, the more we stick to our roles and stay in our lanes, then the better everything is, the more orderly everything is. And so, you know, in, in many ways, that, <laughs> that illusion of control, I think, is, is a big thing that is behind uh, the patriarchy of, of the church and why we don't want to open things up to everyone, especially to 50% you know, of the population. But I think it also also has to do with power and um like I find it interesting that so we uh I spoke to, about George Floyd a little earlier, but even in the Korean context or the Asian contract context, there's racism, right? Like yeah. there are Asians who look down on blacks. I'm gonna be perfectly honest, right? Like it's not comfortable for me to admit it's something that I'm ashamed of, but there you go. So you know, there are power dynamics e even among women, right? Um, yeah. The older women in the Korean church will not allowing uh, younger women to have more influence or power or access to what they think is power within their limited realm of whatever it was, let's say the kitchen. Um, and 
I think that power dynamic we need to be quite honest about. And why is it that no matter your um, your sexual orientation or the color of your skin or the gender that you are, like let's be honest about how power comes into play. Because when you don't have power, when you are excluded, what does that do to a person? And then this is where we come back to. Jesus. Well, I think the uh, I think you yeah, you've, you've brought us right back to uh, what Jesus did and that was um, reach out to the the disenfranchised and the marginalized and uh, include them and treat them as though they were important and certainly in back in his time that uh, that in, included women and so that's I think the you know one of the many many challenges that the church has and all, and all these uh, all the Abrahamic faiths have is how do we treat uh, women how do we treat a full 50 percent of our membership? I have to confess, in many ways, and sometimes I wonder if it's because I'm a visible minority, mm -hmm. I have, for the most part, been really quite lovingly encouraged in ministry. So in some ways, I'm not the greatest person to talk to, uh, because when I think about when I was having a hard time at Knox, um, I had a wonderful female Old Testament professor, but I also had a wonderful uh, basic degree director who was a man who encouraged me to explore my issues with my cultural context and um, and my struggle with schoolwork. So, you know, the minister at St. Giles Kingsley when I was going through the discernment process was a man. Um, like, I, I have been so fortunate. But notice that I'm in the Caucasian context. I am not within the Korean Presbyterian Church in Canada church. And that is for, um, uh, yeah, because I have experienced great amount of pain and discouragement and sadness uh, in terms of not just me as a woman, but you know, my, the, my own personal characteristics and qualities. So I felt I didn't have a place and I wasn't willing to fight there. Right. I wasn't willing to fight for it in that context. Right. Uh, I went where I was welcomed. Um, but I have to admit, you know, certainly uh, it hasn't always been smooth or easy, easy sailing. I remember going to a conference and I was invited to be one of the, um, oh, they had people at this conference who were specifically selected to kind of observe what was going on in the conference and to uh, to kind of do a debrief. And I remember saying, oh, you know, why don't we just pray? And there was an older Caucasian um, minister who was there. And he, instead of asking me, what do you mean by praying, was just frustrated and angry and it was amazing, his anger and how it shut down the whole group or the, the room. And I wonder, did he feel he could do that more readily? Because I'm not tall. Um, I'm a visible minority and I'm a woman. Uh, yeah. And I remember being at a board meeting as well. And I had said I wanted a video doorbell because I couldn't see um, who was outside without making noise because there is a fire door between the hallway and the main door right. and I'm not tall enough to hold open the fire door and look through the peephole and you know pre-COVID there would be times when I was at church by myself and this um, older so I don't I guess he would be in his maybe he's in his 70s late 60s this older white gentleman said like, I don't know why we need a video doorbell. Um, and I didn't say it, Kirk, but oh my gosh, I wanted to. Must be nice to be over six feet white and male. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying that he has never experienced being oppressed. You know, you never know someone's childhood. But I was wondering when was the last time at his height um, and gender and, you know, race, was he, you know, physically restrained or um, yelled at or, you know, um, and he felt like he could not fight back because that was the thing. I felt like I couldn't fight back. I completely shut down. So, um, of course, there's room for improvement in the church, but 
it's not just the church. Uh, I think it's regrettably within society. But as a church, I think where we have failed is we don't set the example. So, you know, we've seen these uh, protests uh, for the Black Lives Matter movement, for BIPOC. Um, how many of them were led by churches? Mm -hmm. uh, churches may have participated, but where are we in making the waves for healing justice? Uh, and that's where I come back to, I think, unfortunately, and I have to confess, you know, there are times I'm one of these people, I'm comfortable. Yeah. And to be pushed out of my comfort zone to say, I'm going to stand up for someone and I'm willing to be spat on or yelled at or made fun of, or have, um, what do you call, you know, tear gas, uh, thrown at me. Like I'm willing to do that. Faith, faith in action. And that's. Uh, as you say, that's a, that is a feeling of the of the church, and I think of of most churches because, of course, we're we're human, and uh, we uh, personify and we reflect um, the societies that we're part of, and um, our job and our expectation, and certainly um, in the in the Christian church, uh, Jesus said, "Pick up your cross and follow me." This is not going to be fun. I'm not I'm not promising you fun. I'm not. This is not going to be good. This is going to be hard. And, uh, yeah, uh, we don't fight for the people who are uh, powerless, and we don't always um, do the things we, we know we should do. And that's a, that's a great reminder. And I think what we forget is there is such joy in, in that journey, that messy, difficult, arduous journey. There is joy. And that's where the Holy Spirit moves when we gather together so that everyone experiences healing justice. And I think that's what we forget. We've lost that. Um, and how do we how do we regain that? Um, yeah. So thank you so much for inviting me to have this conversation with you. <laughs> well, well said. And thank you, Reverend Janet. Appreciate your uh, your joining us today. If you'd like to learn more about Reverend Janet's work in the community, or if you'd just like to reach out and contact her, you can do that through the website of Morningside High Park Presbyterian Church. The website is, just like it sounds, all one word, MorningsideHighPark.com. This has been an episode of the Knitting Pilgrim Talks. We'd like to thank the Ontario Arts Council for their support of this conversation series and their funding of Stitch Class, and the Toronto Arts Council, and the Canada Council for the Arts for their support of the Knitting Pilgrim Show. If you'd like to hear more conversations like this about interfaith matters, stitched glass, and knitting, please check out our episodes at kirkdunn.com or the Knitting Pilgrim YouTube channel.